So now I want to transition into our keynote talk today. So I'm really pleased that Eva Dielman has agreed to give the keynote talk. So Eva uh, gave, or, I'm sorry, received her PhD in computer science from RPI. Uh, she then went to UCLA and did a postdoc, and then she's been at ISI since 2000, so she's been a long-term ISI person here, so it's exciting to share. Uh, she's received a number of awards, including uh, being named an IEEE Fellow, and if we go to the next slide here, then uh, also Eva was named, a, a, I'm sorry, a AAAS Fellow, which is a, you know, quite an honor. Uh, you know, this is work, you know, she's being recognized for her contributions in computer science for the design and optimization of scientific workflows and distributed and high performance environments. She leads a very large group here at ISI in science automation technologies and has been really successful in terms of doing some very high profile work in terms of, uh, you know, sort of the, the impact and people that are using and stuff. And so uh, I'm excited that she's going to tell us about her, her latest work today. So we can go to the next set of slides. Thank you so much for the introduction. <laughs> And it's really a pleasure to be here today, and especially to see everyone on one floor in one place. So it's great to, to uh, meet new people and see new faces. So uh, thank you for the opportunity of giving this talk today. What I would like to do is talk about the work that really kept me at ISI and that I started uh, here soon after joining, and that's the Pegasus Work for Management System. And I will want to talk about how it started, the evolution over the years, and, and the impact that it had. So um, I started working with LIGO, uh, which is a laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory. Uh, it's a large scale NSF funded project. And I started working with a scientist from the project in 2001. The aim of LIGO was to detect gravitational waves that were predicted by Einstein theory of relativity. So working into, uh, this is a picture actually of me uh, at the sister observatory Virgo in Italy in 2001 where I visited them. And we started developing a prototype of what the scientists needed in order to be able to manage the computations and data at large scale across distributed infrastructure. So over the years we did a number of different, uh, uh, we designed different algorithms, we done a number of different optimizations and, and various software levels. However, really from the point of view of science, the real result, result for them came in 2011 where LIGO detected a fake signal in the data. So as LIGO is building the detectors and also the analysis, they wanted to make sure that what if one day the system was fully built and a gravitational wave was passing through that system, they'll be able to detect it. So what they did to test that, they put a fake signal into the data, a small group of scientists from LIGO got together, put the fake signal in, and then the rest of the collaboration was working as normal and finally saw some, something in the detectors. So they did the analysis and they decided that would be, that was a gravitational wave. It had other characteristics, go, the good signal to noise ratio. And so at the big meeting of LIGO, they got together, they opened an envelope to see if it was a real wave. And in fact, it wasn't, it was a fake um, data into, uh, that was fed into the instrument. However, that gave them, um, so it was not a great discovery, but it gave them a notion that if they build an instrument sensitive enough to detect such a, um, uh, such a signal, the infrastructure, the cyber infrastructure, the analysis that they have and the science that they have put into that, uh, to the analysis would detect it. So after that, uh, LIGO actually upgraded uh, the detector and put it back online in 2015. And soon after, they detected some signal in the data. They, it took them several months um, and um, six or seven months to actually be sure that there was a true gravitational wave. They used the software that we developed in our group as part of this analysis. And they, uh, the, um, they um, uh, announced the first detection of a gravitational wave which resulted from the collision of black holes in 2016. Subsequently, uh, three LIGO scientists also received the Nobel Prize, and in 2017, LIGO has uh, detected a merger of neutron uh, stars, which was uh, uh, also detected by other instruments, uh, other telescopes, so that really started the era of multi-messenger astrophysics, which is a very hot topic right now in science. So all throughout the years, we've been working with LIGO, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about what it really takes computationally to support um, detection such as that. So this is what took place for the first detection of a gravitational wave uh, back in 
So it took uh, this obviously the science. So the scientists needed to design the algorithms to be able to look at the data and detect uh, the gravitational wave. They have to take into account various uh, information that's collected by the instrument. So the gravitational waves are relatively weak, so they have to clean out the data and make sure they don't, the seismic phenomena and others uh, don't give them fake signals. Uh, they also, uh, these computations are, are very uh, complex, so they had to do uh, about 107 million tasks, computational tasks, uh, to do, to have confidence uh, in their analysis. And for us, these tasks were organized as workflows, so basically recipes of how to do the coordinate these tasks um, in at the scientific level. And they ran about 21,000 of those to be able to, to have confidence in the data. We did that with Pegasus, which automated the execution of tasks and also the data movement and the data management across the LIGO infrastructure, which was composed of their own clusters, but also the power of a national scale cyber infrastructure, such as the Open Science Grid, uh, Exceed, and others. So uh, I wanted to share some of the experience that we have in building infrastructure that can impact science. So when we I talk about cyber infrastructure, the definition of that that people use is that we talk about computing systems, data storage systems, uh, advanced networks, instruments, repositories, visualization. So everything a science uh, domain or scientist needs to, re, uh, to have results uh, from the science. And from our point of view, what worked for us is really a multi-domain engagement. So LIGO is one of the applications we worked with, but I'll also talk about some others. Uh, we also have been doing computer science research. So supporting large-scale applications such as LIGO requires computer science research. That's not something that you can just engineer. Engineering is important, but we also needed to develop new algorithms. And then most importantly, we also relied on already existing cyber infrastructure that, we, that was dependable, so that we didn't reinvent the wheel. So we had a leg up. One thing that's really critical and was mentioned also in the cyber infrastructure definition are people. So without the people, many of whom are in this room, um, so Karen Vahi, uh, Mats Rind, Rafael, uh, Ferrar da Silva, uh, who are on staff uh, at ISI, as well as uh, two, uh, jo and sorry, and Rajiv Mayani, I haven't seen him this morning, I'm hoping he's here. Um, uh, two, uh, and George, who are uh, PhD students, and I don't know if Patricia, I haven't seen her as well, she's a new uh, PhD student in my group, but uh, the postdocs and many other uh, people that contributed to the effort, who I would not be here today. So I want to thank them very much for the work. In terms of how Pegasus um, got started, uh, so uh, this was a notion uh, of uh, the Sardes virtual, the virtual data grid as part of a Griffin project that uh, Carl uh, Kesselman was a co-PI on, and I was hired for this project uh, at ISI. Initially, the model of a virtual data was that the scientists could come to the system and ask for a piece of data, and the system would give it to them whether the data was already computed or whether it needed to go and actually compute the data on demand. And then so our role was to translate this uh, high-level model into uh, something that's, um, that was applicable to a scientific domain. So in case of LIGO, uh, scientists would come to the system and they would say, conduct a pulsar search on the data that was collected for a certain amount of time. And uh, then the system would need to interpret that and decide, first of all, it would need to understand the request, then determine if the data was already available. If not, it would have to figure out how to actually uh, c compute it, and then plan the various data movements, execution of tasks, and, and deliver it uh, to the user. So uh, we first uh, actually uh, we explored various techniques. So this was work uh, at that time, um, that's about 2002 and a little bit more on, with uh, Yolanda Gill and Jim Blythe. Uh, looking at AI planning techniques of taking this high level of the request that the user had, finding, uh, looking at pulsar searches for a particular time, and then translating into something that the, uh, the system could execute. So we, the plans were basically trying to take this request and developing a pipeline or a workflow that would execute the various steps of a request uh, and deliver the data to the scientist. So we, we demonstrated this uh, prototype to the LIGO folks who were very happy, it was working great. However, the LIGO folks um, looked at this and said, you know, we really don't like to have a web interface. 
what we really like is we like these pipelines. We want to be able to, to manage each particular step. We want to be able to tweak various parameters. So they really wanted something very explicit uh, for their work. So we, we found a new dif the research direction and also a new um, project, Pegasus, that looked at the management of these workflows and various types of uh, infrastructures. So what are the challenges of doing such work? So first of all, uh, we looked at not only LIGO, but other applications, so applications from uh, astronomy and our collaborators uh, at Caltech, uh, applications from earthquake science and our collaborators at the, the Southern California Earthquake Center um, at USC. And we found some common challenges. First of all, they needed to describe their complex workflows in a simple way. Um, also, they needed to access distributed resources. So all these large instruments really collect data at different places. They replicate the data at different places. So you really want to be able to use the data uh, wherever it's most convenient. And they also execute on heterogeneous resources. So yes, may, they may have a campus cluster, but they also have uh, the other resources from the National uh, Science Foundation or from DOE that they can do the work on. And so you also need to be able to deal with these de not only heterogeneous resources, but resources that change over time. So our focus became uh, really on separating the description that the scientist gives that's, diff that's not tied to a particular infrastructure from the infrastructure itself. So then we looked at issues of planning uh, and scheduling this high level description onto the resources that were available to the users. And so for us, looking at scalability, performance, reliability, were things that became important in our work. And obviously also monitoring what's going on in the system. So if we look at the typical uh, computational environment that a scientist might have, so they have some work definition and oftentimes it's done on, on a whiteboard. They have a lo local resource, it could be the, the workstation. They have some data collection mechanism, maybe that they access data from an archive, but maybe they're generating the data in their lab. And then on the other hand, they have all these different resources that are available to them that are funded by the uh, different agencies. So they have uh, NSF funded facilities, DOE, they have their campus clusters uh, like we have at USC. They also have various commercial and academic clouds that they can execute on. But now the challenge is how do you take your, your work definition and translate it into something that will run on all these resources? If you look at only what it takes to run one task of, of these workflows, first of all, on a machine such as um, TAC at, at, uh, Texas, in Texas, which is a high-performance computing cluster, first of all, you need to log on to it. You need to write your script that's very specific to that machine. You need to find the data that you need to bring into the machine, so from an archive from, from, from your local system. You need to submit that script for, oops, for execution. And then you need to stage the data out so you can visualize it to do some other analysis. So this is for only one task. And you remember LIGO had 21,000 uh, workflows with 107 million tasks to execute. So doing this by hand is not scalable. And what if a machine goes down or gets the commission or software changes? So you really need automation that allows you to take the workflow descriptions and map them onto this heterogeneous environment. And that's what Pegasus does. So it takes the description that the user has and it sends out work and manages the data movement across this different infrastructure so the scientists can really benefit from the power of the national capabilities. So if we look at uh, a little bit more in detail about the pe uh, into the Pegasus work for management system, so we operate at the level of files in individual applications, so a code running on a particular file. It allows a scientist to describe the computation at a logical level, so it's not tied down to a particular resource. That's what Pegasus does for them. Um, it uh, also operates on millions of tasks and terabytes of data within a particular workflow. And we can capture provenance information. So we can tell the scientists exactly how a particular piece of data was derived, what codes were used, what systems were used, what data was used. So it supports reproducibility. And obviously we have also monitoring tools that you see on the right and debugging tools. Over the years we developed various interfaces and we worked uh, with Yolanda to, um, to, uh, to have an interface from her WING system, which is a high level a semantic uh, work for composition system, uh, to Pegasus, but also we provide other interfaces uh, in Python and, and uh, other common languages. 
So if we look a little bit graphically of what uh, Pegasus does, so it takes this abstract work for description that you see on the left, where you have the logical file names of uh, what the files that the user wants to compute on. You have the transformations of the codes that you want to, to apply to these files. But you have no information about the execution environment. So Pegasus takes that, uh, this uh, work for description. It uh, looks at what the availability of resources is, where the data is located, and then it generate it generates an executable workflow that decorates the, this original um, uh, abstract workflow with concrete commands to what to execute on particular systems. It moves the data. So it, uh, on the top, you see that in this case, it stages the data uh, to the execution site. Uh, it also can, it stages it out for the user to where the user wants it to go. It registers the data into various uh, da uh, data storage resources or, or archives uh, for, so the user can find it later. It also cleans up the, the data along the way on the execution sites. And this is important when you have um, applications such as LIGO, which have terabytes of data that they touch within a particular workflow. So over the years, what helped us, so we um, used computer science principles uh, in the design of Pe Pegasus. So we structured the workflows as uh, direct acyclic graphs, and then we, can re we could reuse a number of different algorithms of graph traversal, graph traversal um, node clustering, pruning, and other uh, different uh, computations. We also use hierarchical structures in DAGs to give us uh, scalability, so a DAG within a DAG, and you can nest them as much as you'd like. And so that gives us also uh, a dynamic behavior, so you can decide at some point what you wanted to do with in the execution. And then we focus on the development of various algorithms. So for task clustering, when tasks are very small computationally, we can lump them into bigger holes so they're easier to manage. Data placement, so we wanted to place the computation closer to the data. Data reuse, so if somebody already computed the result, you didn't need to execute uh, the entire workflow, and this was going back to this concept of virtual data. Uh, we also did work in resource usage estimation, so we can provision the appropriate resources, for example, on Amazon or other clouds. And recently, also, we've been working um, on in situ workflows where we uh, look at workflows that are tightly coupled. So you have a simulation and some machine learning component or simulation analysis that are running concurrently together at scale uh, on an HPC system, and they need to be coordinated. So one of the successes I think that we had was because um, we leveraged the solutions such as HD Condor, which is a well-known uh, software for distributed computing. And it allowed, uh, it did various uh, tasks for us, so job submission uh, onto heterogeneous resources, uh, management of job dependencies, job retries, and others. Um, also, it allows us to focus, when we had that taken care of, so it allows us to focus on other things, so work for planning, replanning uh, in case of failures, uh, the automated data management, so the user doesn't need to know, need to know and worry about how to uh, manage the data. Uh, various APIs so they can construct the workflows in an easy way. Uh, the monitoring tools that they can use to see exactly what's going on and if there are problems they can dig down and, and figure out uh, what went wrong. And uh, various um, workflow execution engine, in particular one that's MPI based which allows users to run single core workflows, so no tasks that are basically easily run on your laptop. Uh, on HPC systems, so you bunch a whole, whole bunch of them together and you submit them to an HPC system as an MPI job. And so you have efficiency and ability to run a large number of high throughput computing class, uh, tasks on HPC resources. And then also we looked at uh, data um, uh, integrity uh, most recently uh, with collaboration with Indiana University and Renzi, checking during the work for execution that the data has not been corrupted um, when we accessed it uh, for the computations. Uh, another thing that, that I think really worked well for us and others is using real applications to provide realistic testing and evaluation. And in particular, we had a very good collaboration with um, Caltech since 2002 and, and our friends at IPAC that have a montage application which generates science uh, grade mosaics of the sky. And this uh, application is really nice because it's open source, uh, the data is freely available, it scales up and down, and also it's, um, it's robust. 
So not only us, but other people have used it to develop a number of different scheduling algorithms, resource provisioning, provenance tracking, and others. And in literature, if you look at uh, montage and workflow, you see tons of, tons of publications. And we also use it for the Pegasus nightly build and test so we can make sure that our sof software is robust. Let's see if it advances. Oops. So another application that I want to mention, which really pushed the boundaries of what we do, is the CyberShake application from the Southern California Earthquake Center. So this determines what will be the peak earthquake motion over the next um, 50 years. First of all, we looked at Southern California, and then more recently uh, at the entire state. Just to do the Northern California compu computations, and they had to run uh, uh, about 40,000 uh, different jobs that uh, touched 1.2 petabytes of data. Uh, they had, uh, they used 120 million core hours just to develop that map of Northern California. If you look at the map itself, and I don't know if you can see, but there are little white dots that show you all the different workflows that they run to generate uh, this particular map. And this type of applications are important because, as you know, we're in an er uh, earthquake prone area, so building engineers and disaster planners <coughs> need to have that kind of information to be able to build safer buildings. So one thing, if my slide advances, uh, that uh, we also found over the years, so for example, uh, working with LIGO and SCEC, there are various developments of Pegasus since 2001 uh, to the present day. On the top, you have the developments that were primarily driven by LIGO, and these were really focusing on managing the data. So they had a large amount of data that they were collecting and processing. They had uh, computing resources that were tight on data. And so uh, we developed various algorithms that focused on that. The LIGO workflows were single core, so very basically high throughput computing jobs. At the same time, we worked with SCEC, and their workloads were mixed. So they had high performance computing jobs and PI com uh, simulations, and also post processing high throughput computing jobs. But for them, so we looked at things like taking these high throughput computing jobs, putting into bigger ones um, to run on HPC systems. So that actually became very beneficial in 2015 when LIGO was looking at the data from the first potential detection and they needed more computational power to do the analysis. So they went to uh, NSF high performance computing resources and they used things like the Pegasus MPI cluster, the specialized engine that we developed uh, mostly for SCEC to run on these resources seamlessly. So there is really a benefit to this cross pollination. Co -pollination but there is also more complexity to the software. Um, not only we not only work with large scale projects, we also work with individual scientists that benefit from the work that we've done with the larger uh, applications. So Ariella is a, was a, a PhD student at the University of Arizona, and she looked at uh, how humans spread across the world, and she ran on enormous enormous amount of jobs, 12 million jobs on the open science grid ex across 40 different uh, resources there. Okay. So looking ahead, um, what we see is really a growing demand for automation, uh, especially in the area of resource management. So we see HP the various systems that people have access to, HPC systems, distributed systems, clouds really evolving very quickly. The HPC systems are becoming actually more like distributed systems in that they're becoming more complex and heterogeneous. They have specialized uh, storage uh, for data, and they're increasingly faulty. At the same time, distributed systems are also increasing in complexity because now you have uh, new capabilities in programmable networks, for example, that play more into the mix of where you can do the actual computations. And obviously, you also have IoT devices that are also making things more interesting. And then clouds have been used uh, recently more and more for science, but they're also very heterogeneous and costly. So managing this is becoming more complex. And so I think that you know, the technologies that we're developing at ISI and the science we're developing here would be very applicable in this area. For example, looking at machine learning solutions or big data solutions that you, you guys are doing in this room can be applicable to, to this type of um, growing demand for automation. So just to summarize, and I have, uh, that's not my last slide, just to warn you. So, uh, so far, I think the dependable and impactful uh, software that we've developed depended not only on this multi-domain engagement, the science research, the, the reusing of other people's uh, work, obviously the strong team that I have in this room and the collaborations that we have at USC and beyond, but also sustained funding. 
So this will show you a graph of the funding that was targeted primarily for Pegasus uh, since 2007. So in blue, you, have, you can see the uh, funding that Pegasus received. Primarily, this was from, from NSF for core Pegasus development. At the beginning, we were also very much helped by applications. So Skek and LIGO and also our collaborators from NASA have given us funding to, um, uh, to help them specifically with their workflows. In uh, orange, you see the funding that we've received for research, so looking at data placement algorithms, resource provisioning algorithms, and so forth. Later on in gray, we also started getting funding from the Open Science Grid and Exceed, so the infrastructures to support the users in work for technologies on, on the systems. And then finally, uh, in, uh, throughout the time, we also were very fortunate to have application in informatics and, and the projects that Igao and Jose Luis have led to give us additional support for our work. And then finally, um, very quickly, I'll just mention the latest effort that we have, a Cyber Infrastructure C Center for Excellence pilot. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to show you the, the, the diamonds that you see uh, in this graph. These are financial cliffs. So at that time, we had uh, the funding was running out, and we didn't know where the next funding was coming from. And uh, we're fortunate enough that our work was recognized and funded again, so we were able to uh, sustain the project. So uh, my final slide, uh, I just wanted to make, make you aware of the effort that we have in piloting a cyber infrastructure center of excellence. So this is an effort that's a two-year effort to really bring some, build up such a center uh, that's dedicated to the enhancement of cyber infrastructure for science. In particular, uh, in particular we're targeting the large uh, facilities that are funded by NSF, so LIGO, uh, CMS, ATLAS, a number of different um, um, telescopes. And we want it to be a forum for discussion um, around cyber infrastructure sustainability, issues of workforce development, so our infrastructure doesn't happen by itself, uh, training that's, uh, that workforce as well, some of the issues that we actually talked about uh, at yesterday's retreat. Uh, we want to be a key partner for the establishment and improvement of these large facilities when they have these very complicated cyber infrastructure designs. And we're also partnering with other community efforts, for example, in the cybersecurity domain uh, to help build up this center. So this is an ex effort that I'm very excited about and looking forward to um, getting off the ground. So my final slide, i just leave it a, as that, some examples of uh, use of Pegasus in the various science domains, and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, more I, coffee. I, I have a question. Yep. So uh, where do you go from here? I mean, what are, the, what are the key sort of technical challenges that you guys haven't already solved? Because I'm sure there are more. All right, so um, we see definitely in the large facilities uh, and other large projects that, that are funded by a number of different agencies, issues with data management. So, so the amounts of data that are being collected and processed are just incredible. And so uh, we do see challenges in managing uh, these data across the various infrastructure. Also, if you look at, at uh, you know, the projects that we're targeting with a Cyber Infrastructure Center of Excellence, there are also projects that struggle with things uh, such as uh, network connectivity. So one of the projects uh, that we're working off with are the research vessels that go out to sea uh, on various cruises, and they have trouble getting the data off the ships and managing it uh, at the resources that they have on shore. So we're looking at things of how to maybe divide up some of the processing between what's being on board versus uh, using the satellite connection to offload some of the data uh, to shore. We're also looking at um, bringing more IoT type of devices into the system and looking at how workflows can manage the execution of complex analysis from the edge uh, to, the, uh, to the cloud and looking maybe also, um, actually looking more at the technologies that the uh, new networks are providing, so P4 level programming, to do some in-network processing. So the world keeps changing and we keep having new types of things to, um, to deal with, so it's all fun. Thank you. 
So I wanted to ask, um, because I know that uh, running all these computations takes so much work and so many different kinds of skill and expertise, how do you manage the amount of effort that, I mean, you show us a slide, but I can see that there's so many pieces involved in doing all of that work and getting it done. So how do you manage that across expertise areas with scientists that know very little about your technology? How do you manage these, these very, very large, complicated projects? So it, it all comes down to the team. So Mats, Karan, Rajiv, George, that are sitting there, Raphael, uh, two or somewhere also. Uh, so it, it really comes down to the people that I've been fortunate to hire. Uh, Karen has been uh, at ISI since 2001, for example, and is the lead architect uh, on Pegasus. So without him, we would not be able to, to do any of this work. Matt works with a number of different uh, users and has re held many hands and used a lot of Purell to do that. But, you know, so patience um, and really uh, commitment to the cause. So I truly believe that the work that we do is important. And uh, we stayed the course even for the funding dips, trying to see how we can uh, forward that, that vision and work with the great people to make it happen. Thank you. So I'm Jelena Mirkovic from Marina Del Rey office. I wanted to ask, how do you overcome people challenges? How do you get scientists to actually adopt your uh, tool as opposed to sticking to their own practices? Right, so um, obviously I'm sharing the success story. So sometimes we talk to people and just it just doesn't work out. So, you know, we put some effort in and doesn't. But um, I think it helps, first of all, to identify people that um, I need. So they basically can do so much work, but then they have a cliff. They cannot, do, they cannot progress anymore. We can show them what we have done. And the just, a, I know I'm out of time, but a funny uh, uh, caveat about the uh, German Solar Observatory uh, application that was just uh, up on screen. So when the scientists uh, from uh, the Solar Observatory looked at our montage workflows, they said, oh, that's exactly what we do. Even though they are seismologists, they look at the sun and they look at the seismology of the sun for images. So for them, they could relate. So really showing examples of other things and that's relatable works. Okay. Thank you. Exactly.